coming up on episode 178 of Create If Writing, I'm talking about increasing productivity for writers. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. These restless thoughts have kept me up again tonight. Hello and welcome to Create If Writing. This is the podcast for you, an author who wants to sell more books without being smarmy. I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant, and I am so thankful that you are listening, whether this is your first or 178th time to listen to the podcast. Thank you for being here and giving me your time. Even if you're listening to me on double speed, that's fantastic. I am a double speed kind of girl sometimes. Just don't try half speed because everybody sounds really (laughs) drunk or drug. And I know that you're all doing that right now. You're listening to me on half speed just to try it. So hey guys, how you doing? I bet that sounded even more amazing at half speed. Either way, I'm glad you're here. And today we're talking about increasing productivity. And I just, I have to tell you, I didn't want to talk about this ever. I keep having people request this, not just for the podcast, but like, can I, can you teach me how to be productive? And I'm like, no, I really can't. I can't. I don't even want to speak to it. But um, it's been asked enough that I thought I would cover it and was surprised that I sat down. I usually write the blog post that goes along with this. Uh, You can find that at createifwriting.com slash 178. Um, I write the blog post first because that gets the ideas out and then I kind of use that as an outline and I don't read from it. I just use it as the guide as I talk. Uh, I wouldn't say um so many times if I was just reading through a script. I don't like scripts, so that's not my thing. But as I was doing it, I found that uh, in like a little bit over half an hour, I wrote 2,500 words on productivity. So maybe I should have talked about this earlier, but I'll explain why I'm reticent to do so. In any case, That's what we're talking about, productivity. If you want to see the show notes, uh, might have some links to other resources in there. You can go to createifwriting.com slash 178. So let's talk about this and why I've avoided this topic for so long and also why people keep asking me. If you are new to the show, you may not know much about my history, but if you've been listening for a while, you know that for basically the last two years, I've written a novel a month, sometimes more, (laughs) but published about a novel a month definitely written a novel a month. And that was not ever my intention. I did not have that as a goal. It sort of happened, which has changed a lot of sort of the things I think. And we'll get into that as we go. I also have five kids. The youngest is three. The oldest is 11. I don't have a lot of time. I don't homeschool. People ask. That is not my calling. Uh, But I only have right now, three of them are in school. So I have two at home and they're in preschool on days like today when I record the podcast. I've also kept this podcast running for, I think, goodness gracious, maybe five years for coming on. And uh, there have been some breaks here and there, which have been necessary, like in last fall. But overall, I've come back to the podcast and sometimes had weekly episodes. There was a time I was recording several podcasts a week, not just podcast episodes, but I had a different podcast that I was running. Um, And so it's anyway, I'm doing a lot of things and getting a lot done. And so people do ask me how I get it done. And I've shared a few tips here and there, but overall, I've really not wanted to talk about this because I feel like the things that work for me, first of all, are kind of weird. Like I am not, I mean, we're all individuals, but like I am totally okay just going out there and saying I'm a little bit strange and what works for me doesn't seem like stuff that might work for other people. So I'm like, what would I recommend to you? Because my methods are strange. I've also really not studied productivity. And so there are probably tons of resources out there. I'll probably, I'll link to some in the show notes, but there are much better qualified people who've studied this and tested things that have more things to say. But I'm going to talk today in general ways about how you can figure out what works for you and kind of the mental game of it. And that's the other aspect that made me not want to talk about it because I'm not a very woo-woo person. I'm much more about action. And yet I'm going to give you a lot of things that have to do with your mindset and the way you're framing things. So That's why I didn't want to talk about it. And then I got really excited writing the blog post and I'm happy to share the things that I'm sharing today. And I do hope that they will help you increase your productivity. But we have to start with a caveat. So this whole conversation about productivity, it has the potential to derail people. And in episode, let's see, 176, I talked about success stories and how people now, a lot of times in Facebook groups will share success stories. And these can be good or bad. They can motivate you or take you to a dark place of 
comparativitis. And uh, that is the same thing with productivity because hearing someone like me say, I have five kids and also I'm putting out a book a month, that may make you just be like, I'm done turning off the podcast. (laughs) I'm not doing anything anymore. We're out because I can't compare to that. But productivity is not about comparing to somebody else. It's not about how well you produce on a sliding scale. It's not graded on a curve with all of your peers who are doing the same thing as you. When we're talking about productivity, or at least when I'm talking about it, it's about getting the most bang for your buck, the most ROI, I love that word, the return on your investment. Productivity is about getting the best result with the least amount of wasted time, energy, and maybe even money sometimes. So I'm not encouraging you to try to up your word count to some insane goal. I'm not encouraging you to try to put out a book a month like I do. I'm not encouraging you to do any specific things other than to challenge yourself to figure out what is the best result that you can have with the least amount of wasted time, energy, and money. So I will share some personal examples and some ideas, but you are going to have to really tailor this to you because productivity is not a one-size-fits-all thing. It really isn't. So if you can go and find some other resources with specific ideas, that's fantastic. But if those people are trying to tell you this is the way to work, this is the one way, just run screaming away. (laughs) No, 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 that's not how it works. It is individual. So as you're listening to this, you need to be thinking about what will work for you. Okay, so as we're thinking about that, that's moving us into this whole mindset for productivity. And mindset is another thing I don't like talking about. It's become one of those like catch words, I guess, and catch phrases and kind of along with manifestation, which I like even less where it's like kind of that idea that you just think it and then make it happen. Um, and I, I have a high school friend who's uh, got a new manifestation business and she has a new offering where she's talking about manifesting your husband. And I was like, I mean, good for you that this is your business, but what? (laughs) So this is, I avoid these mindset topics because I start thinking about things like that that just feel very far from what I believe. However, I do talk, uh, if you've ever heard me give a talk or even on the, the Creative Writing website, I talk about reframing the conversation around things like author platform and marketing because writers have such a hard time with this. Creatives have a really hard time with selling and it often takes that mindset shift the reframing. So I do talk about that, but sometimes I just, I get a really, like, I kind of want to run away when we start going into the mindset area. I'm not a woo-woo person. I'm a to-do person. I want action and I want to take it now. However, I've discovered that the whole reframing idea, the mindset idea is, is integral. So here are a couple of examples and some of these I have given before and I'm sorry, but these are just the best and easiest ones. Um, but for years, you know, I started this podcast in 2015. I was not writing fiction. I was writing nonfiction. And I wanted to work with authors about this whole reframing the idea because I love social media. I love blogging. I had been blogging professionally and really studying social media for years before this. And uh, so I wanted to kind of help authors bridge that gap. Um, I went on lots of interviews and people would ask me like, why aren't you writing novels? Because you have an MFA in fiction. And I would say definitively, I cannot write novels until my kids are all in school, all five of them. And that was years ago. So now I may have more at home then. Now I'm still two years away from having all five kids in like all day school. Um, And yet I'm writing novels. So I had been telling myself this for years and I was sure of it. When I tried writing novels, like when I first started having kids, we, I had an agent and I was sending, she was sending things to New York and then that didn't work, but they wanted more manuscripts for me and they were waiting. And I kept trying to write and make office hours and do all these things and just get a, like a tiny window of time. And, you know, kids would be teething or they wouldn't sleep or they would interrupt my time and I would get frustrated with them and with me and with my writing and it really didn't work. And so I just said, I can't do it. I'll just wait, you know, for however many years until they are all in school and then I'll go back to writing. And until then I'll do nonfiction stuff and teach authors about things like email lists. But when our financial situation changed a little bit a year ago, um, we were in need of an income. And I also kind of, I like a challenge. Um, And so I was seeing that clean romance was really on the rise. And I was like, you know, I could write this, Um, which A, that was like way too much hubris. And I was quickly humbled and had to do a lot more reading and research. Um, But I decided to try something that I've been saying I couldn't do, write fiction, and also in a genre I never would have imagined myself doing because I really didn't read romance and I'm 
pretty like cynical about <laughs> romance and romance novels where I was. That's also changed. So I went ahead and was like, okay, we're just going to do this. It's like a little challenge. We'll see. And um, you know, that was in December. I thought about it. I really quickly wrote a short story and then published it, my first novel in March. Second novel, I think in June. And starting in July, I was making four figures solidly, sometimes very high four figures um, consistently and have, have been since then. So um, totally not what I had told you know, these interviewers or told myself. Um, and so really, I had to do my own personal reframing. And, you know, it took a challenge, a couple challenges, an external challenge of needing some more income, but also I'm the kind of person who likes like, okay, this seems impossible. So let's see if I can do it. Um, I've always enjoyed that. And so those two things kind of work together. And now I'm in a completely different place doing things I would not have imagined when I started this podcast five years ago. So when you're thinking about productivity, what this really means and kind of looking at my story is you have to start identifying your blocks, the things that are in your own head getting in your way of productivity. And there's kind of two extremes of this. First, you need to stop putting so much pressure on yourself to live up to unrealistic standards. So we can get caught up in these standards and make ourselves feel guilty. But the other side of that is you need to stop selling yourself short and think that you can never do something. So on the one hand, you're looking at maybe like someone else's success story and you're thinking, I feel, you know, guilty. I can't live up to this. I, there's so much pressure. I, I just give up. And that creates a block. Or you are thinking to yourself, like, I'm never going to do something because I'm this way. So there's like the unrealistic standards. And then there's the staying in your same place because you don't have any standards. You're like, my standards are so low. We're just going to sit here and not take action. So feeling guilty, feeling pressured, feeling like you can't live up to something. It's like having a cloud hanging around your head. And as I was writing this, I thought of the example of Pigpen from the Peanuts cartoon and how everywhere he goes, he has this cloud of dust that follows him. And so if you're you know, walking around with this cloud of negative dust where you're thinking that you're guilty for not doing what someone else is doing, you're not as productive, you're beating yourself down, comparing yourself to like a high level of productivity, that's just following you around. We call that stinking thinking in my house, which came from a good college friend named Jenny. Um, it creates a negative spiral and that gets in your way. It actually causes you to be less productive. And when we're putting limits on ourselves, on that flip side of it, when we're not looking, so on the one hand, you're looking at somebody else's huge goal. And then the other hand is you're kind of looking at yourself where you're thinking like, no, this is my tiny box I'm going to stay in. You're also missing out because you've put yourself in a tiny box. I never would have thought that I could write a 60,000 word novel almost entirely on an elliptical machine typing into my phone with my thumbs. And yet I did it. Again, it wasn't a goal. For me, sometimes goals also get in the way. And this is what I'm learning about myself. Um, but I had a challenge. I had this idea I couldn't get out of my head. So I thought I'd start it. And I was at the gym and I just had to do it. Um, if I had been, you know, letting myself get in my own way, I would have said, no, 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 you can't write on a phone or on a piece of gym equipment. And for some people, um, you know, I feel like I should have like a medical warning here. Like, <laughs> I am not going to be held responsible if you try to write on an elliptical and hurt yourself. I am not legally responsible. Can I, I don't know that that's legal, but um, it may not work for me. It might not have worked for me, but it did. And I never would have known if I had listened to that voice inside myself. That's like, you can't write at the gym. You can't write on your phone. You shouldn't write right now. You got to wait until you're at the right spot at the right time of day. You know, the kids are here or it's night or you have a babysitter, whatever the situation was. Those are the little boxes that I had put myself in. And once I realized that I could actually do this, I still write, you know, this week, actually, I've been writing at least a thousand words every time I go to the gym, um, in addition to other writing that I'm doing during the day. So my my output has increased just by letting myself do that. Plus, I'm, you know, getting sweaty and staying in shape. It's fantastic. I think endorphins are fantastic. <laughs> so um, I'm actually more productive. I think if I'm really focused on writing a scene, I can do about 3000 words an hour on the elliptical machine, just in Google Docs on my phone. Again, if I had stayed in the little box where I thought I have to just sit here, I can only write on a computer, I can only write when this, you know, mood is right. I never would have done that. So we can't compare ourselves to others and get put down by thinking they're so good, and we can't do it. We also can't not ever try to have big goals and stick ourselves in a tiny 
box. So what this means is we need to identify how we work. So you need to identify how you work. This is not identifying how well someone else works, though you can get inspiration and ideas. And again, going back to that episode 176 about the success stories, you want to be able to take something away from someone else's story, but not get caught in like the trap I just talked about with the whole guilt and pressure and feeling like you're comparing yourselves. But when you're thinking about what makes you work well, there are a couple factors at play here. And one of them is seasons, uh, the season of life that you're in. And really, this kind of means circumstances. But I like the idea of seasons because it's kind of a rhythmic idea. And I do think that we have rhythms. Um, if I went back to myself when I was, you know, back with kids and thinking, okay, I'm giving up on writing novels, I'm just gonna write blog posts, which I did for years and years and years, I still had other creative work um, in between the time when I gave up trying to send things to my agent. And when I started publishing on my own, um, maybe if I tried some of these things, they could have worked for me. Maybe I would have written novels in clean romance sooner or something else. But I really think there's something to these seasons. And I think there was a reason that writing felt so heavy to me. Part of it might have been genres, writing literary fiction that is a lot heavier, takes a lot more. Having done both, it takes a lot more of you than writing genre fiction for me. But I'm not sure telling myself, go try to write on the elliptical machine would have helped back then because the season I was in was really different. Yes, I have five kids now. I have more kids, more things to do, more lunches to make if I'm making lunches at all, more people to tuck in at night. But I also have this sort of confidence that nobody's died yet. <laughs> like I've kind of got this thing. There's no, there's no coasting with parenting, but I'm also able to do a little bit more relaxed parenting when you know, it was my very first child. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no confidence that I could keep that baby alive, no idea what to do with the baby, constantly Googling things and asking questions. Whereas now something happens. I'm like, ah, oh, that happened. We'll figure it out. Everything's okay. There's a, there's a whole different feeling of confidence that I have now that impacts my mental state. My level of stress, yes, it's high. I've got five kids. They are wild, loud, amazing, chaotic monsters. It is not a quiet, easy house by any means. But that said, this season is a little bit easier in some ways. I have a little bit more of a, I don't know, maybe just brain space to do this kind of writing. Yes, it's still hard. I'm limping through parenting five kids, but I feel like I'm in a better place to write. So even though I am saying, you know, maybe I could have tried writing and I did often kind of touch base with myself during those years. They, okay, I said I couldn't write. Let's let's take a week commit to writing time every day and see how it goes. And it kept it kept failing. Um, but if I had stayed in that box and not pushed myself, I never would have gotten through it and I still wouldn't be writing novels right now. Seasons matter. You need to consider the season you're in, the circumstances you're in, because you can't always change them. You don't want your season to become an excuse, but it also really is sort of the context for which you're living and the context for how much you can give at this point. So you need to ask yourself, what impact does my current season have on me and my writing? How does it shape my productivity? So you need to find that happy place that's somewhere in between using it as an excuse and not considering it at all. You have to consider it, but you can't use it as an excuse. You need to find that place in the middle and keep pushing those limits, which is something we're gonna kind of end on. Every so often you need to check in and say, okay, am I in the same season that I was in a year ago? <laughs> I'm, are the circumstances the, the same? What's changed? Has my mental state changed? My circumstances of having kids, I've only got more now, but my mental state has changed. So once you're thinking about your season, then you need to kind of think about your best work habits. And I feel like this is where most productivity talks center is on the like ideas for productivity. So this is going to be the like nitty gritty where I'm going to give you some ideas, but I'm not even giving a very exhaustive list here because I think what you can do once you've got kind of the right mental state is, is go out and, and look. There's some great books on productivity if that's your thing. I'm an action girl. I don't want a book on productivity. Maybe a blog post with a list. So I've that's what I've done is I've got a list for you. Um, but when it comes to finding out your best work habits, this is back to you. It's about you. You need to know yourself. And I still feel like at 42, I'm learning about myself. And the more I learn about myself, the better I get at the things I'm trying to do. It took me, I think, till senior year of college as an English major writing constant papers to realize that I wrote better papers quicker. My productivity therein was better if I planned to finish the paper a day before it was due. 
If I waited till the last minute and pulled an all-nighter, I spent way more time writing. My writing was not as good. I was stressed out and didn't sleep and drank way too much Diet Mountain Dew and Twizzlers. It was not good. So once I figured that out, what I planned to do, and, and I think this is just a middle thing. Again, I'm kind of weird. This is how it worked for me, is the stress of the deadline approaching really made my brain kind of freeze up and seize up and not work. So if I was like, I've got a whole day left, it was really easy to finish that paper a day early. So again, weird example, but when you're finding out the things that work for you, it's very helpful and it makes you able to do more work better and waste less things. So I did ask in the Facebook group, if you're not in there, you can go to createifwriting.com slash community. Uh, um, just tips for productivity. And I got some really good ideas. And then I'm going to share a couple things that have really worked specifically for me um, in the past year or so. And, you know, again, these, this is not a very long or exhaustive list. And so you probably, I'll try to link to some resources, but, you know, just look for some other resources on specific productivity things, which I think is where most of these conversations fit. So here are some things that helped me or helped people in the group. Timers, time activated playlists planners and calendars, dividing up daily tasks, or sitting at the beginning of the day, making a very short list of the daily tasks, creating daily schedules for what you'll do at what block of time, using a to-do app, starting the morning by looking at your day and the things that have to be done so that you know what you're doing, or maybe planning out your week in one night of the week. And really all these can be like a combination. You could be doing a lot of these things. Batching like tasks, as in doing all of your images at one time, all your social media scheduling, all your writing of emails at one time. Distraction-free devices, I've seen some people using those, or distraction-free blocks of time where you're committed to do nothing else but write. Finding the right work zone or space. Committing to one set time a day that you don't deviate from for writing. And then little things like having your favorite beverage, food, or other motivator, the thing like, does having coffee help you write? I love having coffee next to me. I don't have to have it, but I like it. It's motivating. Finding the best physical position. Do you write best sitting down? If so, sitting down on a couch, sitting down in a hard chair, sitting on a stool, or standing. I like to um, alternate between those. I tend to go places that have like high bar tables, and I sit in the high bar stool, and then I will stand there as well. That is not a very long list. These are just a few ideas and things to consider. And I want to go into a little bit more depth on some of the things that have worked specifically for me. And again, I share these because these are ideas to spark ideas in your own mind of what could work for you. These may not work for you. They may not work for you. Um, Again, it's all about finding what works for you at this time in your life. So for me, one of the things that has really helped me to be more productive is working on my phone, not the computer. And I've already mentioned this and how I write at the elliptical, but I also don't just write at the gym. If I'm sitting somewhere and I have a little bit of time, I can write then on my, on my phone. Um, I can write in little snatches of time that I would not have otherwise been able to do because I used to just write on my computer. And then writing in Google docs is another one because this allows me to write on my phone when I have it. And then also have that sync up with the computer. And one day I actually went out to work and forgot my computer and didn't realize till I was 20 minutes away. And it was like, okay, so I could waste a whole bunch of time going back, getting my computer or, hey, I can write in Google Docs on my phone. So that has actually been something that's helped me be more productive as well. This week, I've been doing timed writing sprints. And a lot of times when people talk about sprints, they mean a set amount of time where it's just writing and the goal is to write quickly or just write continually for that time. Um, I've had some editing sprints as well, but basically I'll set a timer I will check my word count at the beginning and the end, which if I'm editing one one time, it was like a 50 word or another time it was like 1500. So it can be a big change. There's some variance there. But the overall point of, of this for me was setting a timer for 27 minutes because that's my weird amount of time I like to use. And then I set a timer when I'm done with that for a three to five minute break. And if I can, I'll do, um, usually I've only been able to have a block of time where I do like three at a time. I'd love to do more because I get so much done during that time. Typically, I do between 1,000 and 1,500 words in that 27 minutes. And that's on my computer. Um, I've also been scheduling a set writing time. And this week, I started planning to do my writing between about noon and three and then doing as many of the sprints as I can. I don't always get the full three hours, but knowing that means that I have to finish recording this podcast right now because we're going into my noon time. 
Accountability has been really helpful. I started doing the sprinting with a writing accountability partner, Jenna Hatley, and uh, we've been just basically checking in on Messenger saying, I'm, I'm going to start my sprint now. We're not always syncing up with our timers. And she does like 20 minutes, I do 27. But whenever either of us finishes, we check in on Facebook. And just knowing that the other person is there doing it really helps. And so we've also, I've been starting a daily thread in the collective, which is the membership community, the paid membership community. And, you know, not everybody can do that either, but it's kind of gotten some people excited, I think. And it's really fun to just see other people that are doing it as well, even if it's not the exact same time. So that accountability is helpful. I mentioned before ideal workspace. Mine is not at home. Um, we're in the middle of renovations, but even before everything was trashed and covered in drywall dust, um, I have a writing space, but it just is very hard. It's very hard for me to escape the other duties and the mindset things that I just distract me at home. Um, we'll see when I get my new office once we're done, if that helps, but mostly I have to get out of the house and go somewhere that has Wi-Fi and a plug and hopefully something where I can stand and sit. So I've been finding that as, you know, a coffee shop or the YMCA. And then that leads me to the last one, which is creative childcare options. And this, obviously, you know, I'm in a state where I need childcare. I do not have the kind of children that I can usually write while they're around at all. Um, and again, I don't want to be that mom who's irritated. I mean, I'm irritated a lot of the time anyway, but I don't want to be irritated being disturbed from my work. So I just try to do my work when they're either asleep, which lately night has not been a friend to me working. So I'm trying to do other things. Um, but I was in a Facebook group for moms and one of the moms mentioned she joined two gyms and she worked from home and had little ones. And so she would go to each gym, one in the morning for two hours and one in the afternoon for two hours because they usually have a limit. And those were her four hours of work every day. Her kids were playing with other kids and being watched. And the cost for that is astronomically cheaper than if you were to hire a sitter. Because right now, babysitters are like 15 to 20 an hour, I think. Um, we almost never hire one because we can't afford it. It's just crazy. Um, but that would mean, you know, my YMCA membership is somewhere between like, I think it just went up, but it's like somewhere between 75 and $100. So I mean, like a couple days at the Y and, I, and that's like paid for that month, really, if I were comparing it to a babysitter. So finding a creative childcare option, and I've recommended this to so many other moms, and I've seen a lot more moms doing this. And at first, I felt really guilty, like, but I'm not working out. I do work out. Um, but I also sometimes sit in the lobby and drink coffee for those two hours. And that's okay. That's okay. I was doing the math. And that was like that four hours, that seems like a lot because we do belong to a gym. And I go work out. And then the why and sometimes I'll go to both. And um, I did the math on that and I was like, well, I still have my kids for an enormous number of hours a day, even if I do those too. Uh, so finding the creative solution for childcare or whatever you know thing might be keeping you from writing. The point is this, seek out different solutions, hear what other people say works for them, and then try some of those for yourself, which leads us to the last point of this productivity talk, which is the need to challenge yourself. And you've heard me talk about this multiple times where I have challenged myself to write in a genre I didn't usually write and at a time when I didn't think I could write with kids, um, challenging myself to rethink and reframe. You have to do the same and this is a continual thing. Um, but again, there's no guilt in this, okay? So if you challenge yourself and you're like, okay, I'm not like getting a higher word count, that's fine, don't beat yourself up. If you try something, um, you know, I've talked to some people who are dealing with debilitating or just really difficult medical circumstances or other circumstances and they just wanna get their thing done and they can't, let it go for now and chalk that up to season and do what you can, but don't let yourself um, get heavy over it and feel guilty over it or like a failure because those things will only make you less productive because they're making your mind kind of seize up. Um, but challenging yourself is all about discovering what beliefs are limiting yourself um, and what circumstances maybe can actually change because sometimes there are some that can change. It's a continual thing. It's not a one-time thing. You can do it now after you listen to this episode and then maybe next week or next year. Um, but it's something that you need to do. And I think one key part of the challenge is to try things that you don't think will work. So this week, here's my specific example. I've been reading books on plotting and I am a pantser. If you've heard the terms plotter, who someone who outlines uh, the shape of a book before writing and pantser, who's someone who writes by the seat of their pants, I am 100% in the pantser category. I come up with an idea, sometimes just a scene. Sometimes I hear a flash of dialogue and I start writing. Sometimes I may think I know where the end is going. Sometimes I may think I know where the middle is going. Sometimes I'll sketch out ideas in a Google Doc, but 
mostly I just start writing and see where things go. I am always surprised in my books. And so I've told myself I don't need to plot. But this week I thought to myself, what if not plotting is actually hindering my productivity? What if you know, I'm already productive, right? I don't have any complaints. But what if I could write better and write faster or write more if I'm plotting? And so I'm actually reading a few different books and kind of skimming through and I'm going to try to do this with my next book. Maybe it'll make it better, maybe worse, maybe it'll make me faster, maybe slower. I'm not sure, but I'm giving it a try. And so for you as well, when you're considering productivity, I don't want you to get stuck in one spot, like to figure out what you feel like is the best for you right now and then stay there forever because lots of things change, not just seasons, circumstances, goals, abilities, desires, um, all of those things can change. And so it's important to keep coming back and looking at this again. So for a person who is kind of woo-woo hating, mindset rejecting, this is a lot about your frame of mind. And I don't know if you're expecting or hoping for more specifics, but I feel like this is a much better way to kind of understand and frame the idea of productivity. And then you can go out and find all the lovely posts people have done about specific things, find some of those ideas and challenge yourself, but always staying in the space that's positive, not feeling guilty, not comparing yourself to somebody else, but also challenging yourself to see if maybe you can do things that you never thought were possible. All the while remembering productivity is finding your best output with the least amount of wasted time, energy, and money. I didn't just say the least amount of time, energy, money, the least amount of wasted time, energy, and money. You may never be as productive as someone else. That's fine. As long as you're not wasting your own time, as long as you're hitting your goals that you want to have or trying to reach them, that's fine. It's all about you in this season. So don't let other people's productivity cause you to stumble, but also take inspiration where you can. And especially don't get in your own way. Find out what works best for you right now. And then every so often, take a step back and challenge yourself. Those are my thoughts on productivity. If you want to see the show notes, go to createifwriting.com slash 178. Also, I am going to be doing a series of workshops. And the next one coming up is a book launch workshop on March 18th, 2020. And you can go to createifwriting.com slash workshop to find out more information and sign up. These are paid, um, very affordable $50 workshops. And we're going to talk all about book launches for fiction and nonfiction. They're about two hours with a replay included. I want to thank Jasmine Commerce of jasminecommercemusic.com for the tunes you are hearing at the beginning and end of the show. And I want to thank you, the listener, for being here and for your support and continued ears listening to the podcast. Now it's that time for you to go out and create content that you love and serve your people well. I